Well, we should probably get going here just to maximize our time. Uh, we want to keep it to an hour. And I'm um, pleased that Dr. Wendy Gers has uh, agreed to speak with us. Everyone should know that this is being recorded. And Wendy, I, I sent out her website so you could you could look at that if you wanted a little more information. And I'm sure more will join us here as we go. So Wendy, take it away. Thank you so much, um, Elaine. It's a great privilege to be here with you. Um, I've got a, a PowerPoint presentation that I'd like to share. So I actually haven't even checked if I'm a co-host, but if I'm not, could, could you do so? Um, I'll do that, yeah. Just to say hi to Catherine Glende, a fellow South African, um, who's currently here. It's great to have you here, Catherine. Thanks for joining. I think you should be able to share now. Okay, okay thank you. Um, let's do that. Um, I just turn off my video. It's easier that way. Okay, so are we good? Um, you can see my full page and everything. Yes. It's super. Yep. Uh, well, yeah, it's a great honor to be here today. Thank you so much, Elaine. And um, thanks to everybody who's been here. Once again, apologies to everybody who I'm misinformed about the time. I, 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 got, it, I got it wrong and sent everybody an hour early to, to the website. So apologies and thanks to those who um, emailed me and are here. Today I'm gonna to be speaking about ceramics, research curating and discourse. Um, and just by way of introduction, I'm a curator, an art historian um, and lots more. I currently have honorary positions at the University of Sunderland where I'm a visiting professor and the University of Johannesburg, where I'm a research associate. Um, before I, I continue, um, on a more personal note, I'm born and bred South African, as you may be able to tell from my accent, but I've lived in many countries. However, I'd like to just have a, a few moments of silence. I know we are silent, but um, some very terrible things are happening in South Africa at the moment. Um, there's very, very serious civil unrest. And I'd just like to kind of hold a hold space for them for a minute or two. And if if you have faith, say a prayer. And if you don't, just hold space for that country and, and wish them peace because it's it's not nice. And um my parents are in the thick of it and don't have food, for example, um, don't have fuel, don't have flour, don't have vegetables. And it's it's very scary for everybody there. So um, yeah, let's just hold space for them for a minute. Or I would, before, before we start that, I would really like everyone to mute themselves because I think we're getting a little interference here, but um, anyway. Okay, thanks, Elaine. Yeah, so let's just hold, hold, hold space for South Africa for 30 seconds. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, so, so who am I? Yeah, I'm a curator and um, Elaine, thanks for sending out the website. I call myself an activist scholar and um, I make a very concerted effort to put all my writings on academia, which is an open source website so that people in my home nation, South Africa, who don't have access to Academic libraries um, can access, and people all over the world can access as much as possible my, my research and my publications. More recently, I did a coaching qualification and work as a coach and mentor for artists, helping them develop their practices. 
And most recently, my, my um, biggest pivot or my most exciting pivot to date, in a sense, is as an environmental consultant. And I've established a not-for-profit called Clean Green Ceramics. And I'll also tell you a little bit more about that journey, um, specifically how my research and curatorial practice um, is at the heart of that. So um, I, I looked at the calendar today and I realized it's almost day for day, the, the date or the anniversary 25 years ago when I started working in South Africa in my first curatorial job, which, which obviously dates me <laughs> rather a lot. Um, in that time, I've had a family lived in many countries and um, published quite extensively and been very fortunate um, to, to be invited to many places across the globe and to lecture. And, and now with the pandemic, really, that's accelerated quite extensively. And I have um, a, you know, an irregular webinar and, and do quite a lot of online teaching. Okay, Somebody still got their mic on. If you wouldn't mind muting yourself, we're getting a bit of feedback. Elaine, you might be able to mute everyone as the host. Of course, you don't have to unmute Wendy. That would probably be the only other, unless she's at a host too. It may be the only person I can see with the mic on is Josephine Shear. Okay, we good. Um, so I've, I've just placed here a curatorial statement. It's not mine. It's something that means a lot to me. Um, this is a very short extract from the late Okwi and Riza, who's a really great Nigerian um, curator who did the second Johannesburg Biennale, who did, I think it was a 2014 Venice Biennale. Um, uh, he's done a manifesto. He's really like, you know, a curatorial superstar and thinks about curating in really interesting ways. And um, he, he speaks of an exhibition being a way to engender new ways of looking at the deep entanglements between art society and its institutions and the ways in which all the residues of the encounter between public artists and institutions are registered in the context of historic narration. And, um, I, you know, I think that's one really great, I mean, we're still having feedback. Um, do you want to try and meet everybody, Elaine? Okay. So yeah, I think this is a wonderful definition of what curating is, specifically the latter part about the context of historical narration, which links into both our contemporary social milieu um, and how that is, you know, which is both um, culturally influenced or overdetermined, um, as well as geographically significant. And the, this notion of historical narration also um, as being one that is that acknowledges um, the, the, the narratives of art history and of exhibitions, and that every, every exhibition, whether it's ceramics or whatever you're making, is in historical dialogue with every other exhibition that precedes it. And, um, the importance of having that broader context and knowledge and um, certainly from my position being very fortunate to, to have traveled quite extensively and, and really try to delve into global, global nuances within global and local nuances um, within sort of the curatorial space. I was born um, 50 years ago, I just turned 50, in a small city outside Cape Town. I wanted to show this picture as South Africa burns. It's a beautiful picture, but it also shows what a lot of people don't realize. South Africa is a very 
you know, a Western, Western country with skyscrapers and all the rest. I'm sure I don't need to tell the group here, but one still regularly shock and still I'm still shocked at how many people are very ignorant of what South Africa is and looks like. Um, I was very fortunate after high school to spend a year in a tiny little town in Australia called Bundaberg. And that was a, as a Rotary Exchange student. It was during high apartheid and I faced a lot of controversy and opposition from local groups um, within, even within my high school. Um, I was verbally abused um, on a regular basis and um, being the, the turbo nerd that I am, I sort of decided I was going to, to educate Australians um, and to set this personal goal of giving one speech a week. And during that year, I gave 53 speeches to different groups ranging from nursery school children to uh, senior citizens. Um, I even gave bowling groups, you know, anybody who wanted this like mad South African kid to come and talk, I did. And they just, you know, whatever they wanted me to talk about, I would. And I had, a gr it was those sort of days when we had old slides. Okay, somebody, can you please turn, there's a lot of feedback there. Um, but yeah, it was all some golden olden days of, of slides where you had the carousel and you put your slides in and by the end of the year, all my slides were burnt and warped from, from being so used. But it was a great opener, eye opener for me on so many levels and what this image shares um, with the next one uh, is colonial architecture and how the legacy of the British Empire has marked itself on the public space and imagination in um, countries such as South Africa and Australia, among many others. This building is the old arts block at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where I spent the better part of, um, well, I spent my entire undergraduate degree, a large part of it, and um, that subsequently registered for a, a Master of Arts in History of Art, and um, focused on ceramics. It was a very, uh, sorry, it was a very formative time for me studying in the early 90s. It was on the eve of democracy and um, the students in my faculty and in my department just kind of rebel because we were being taught Western art history and nobody wanted that anymore. We were tired of uh, Gardner, Jansen and Arneson, which were teaching surveys of world history of art, primarily European, um, up until about 1968. Uh, Arneson obviously has um, post, is very strong in post-war American uh, history of art, as, as is Gardner. But those were the sort of textbooks and we realized there were no art history textbooks. There was interesting texts written by archaeologists, by sociologists, by ethno um, ethnologists, but no, no local art history. And so my generation was very much, um, well, halfway through second year, we said, we, you know, we're going into the field and we, we're doing primary research. There's no way about, you know, around this. We need to we need to engage with our local communities and be writing these these histories that have been written often with a very strange um, with very strange sort of framing questions and devices. So um, yeah, from my second year, we were going into the field interviewing Zulu craftsmen um, and artisans. Uh, and, and really looking at museum collections. And um, at that moment, I sort of had an epiphany. I discovered this uh, very strange collection of South African ceramics from the 50s in the local museum that nobody knew. And I was curious about it and nobody could answer questions. So I set off on this pilgrimage to, to find out more about these very funky but really racist um, ceramics that depicted black women um, in very evocative manners and very stereotyped and highly exaggerated um, tribal, sort of tribalized, um, but totally fantastical headdresses, etc. Um, 
So that was sort of my journey and I fell into ceramics, I would say by accident, but when the bug bit, <laughs> it bit really big. Do I make ceramics? I get asked that all the time. Um, no, I don't. But I have made in the past because I believe it's really important to, to know what I'm writing about and write intelligently having material knowledge. My first curatorial job, as I said, was 25 years ago, pretty much to the day in this very sweet art museum, which is called the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. It's in two separate buildings um, at the entrance to St. George's Park and a big cricket stadium. Uh, it had really beautiful clerestory lighting, as you see in the top left image, and um, it was just a lovely space. I had an amazing director who was very supportive of my ceramic research and encouraged me to do uh, to take my MA in progress and turn that into a big exhibition, and not even turn into a big exhibition, but tour that nationally for a year. So um, in 1998, um, I produced this catalogue and, and organised a national touring exhibition, and that was prior to the publication of my MA thesis, which focused on three commercial studios from the 50s, Kalahari, Drosty and Crescent Potteries, and um, really looked at identity politics, at who made these works and why they were made, and I was really fascinated by the 50s um, because within South Africa and, and more generally uh, internationally, it was a period of great nation building, a period of prosperity, a period of wealth, a period where women were very empowered. Um, and, and I really kind of wanted to fit these, trying to understand how that all pieced together. And, um, and so I looked very specifically at um, image, you know, gender stereotypes, images of women and San parietal art. The San are the first people of South Africa and their parietal art, rock art and engravings were, had sort of been um, pl plagiarized, I guess is the best word, by, by artists uh, since the early 20th century um, to make decorative motifs. I left the art museum in 2000 and moved to a small town in rural Spain called Manresa. This is Manresa, where I learned Spanish, a bit of Catalan, worked um, in a local museum as I didn't have the right to legally work. So I could only work as a volunteer. Um, I also started a family um, in, you know, two or three years into this, just, just as I left Spain actually in 2002. Um, but I had a really amazing time in um, Spain. During that period, I, con well, I continued my research into Southern African ceramics, which had started with this big exhibition. And I set up a Facebook group called South African Pottery History, which now has 2.3 thousand members. And it's really just, I, I started it as a research space to ask questions about different aspects of South African ceramics and, um, and it's just grown into this wonderful independent space, which is now a bit of who made this. Um, but, but that's also okay. I'm sure it, you know, it, it will continue to evolve. Um, I then um, moved to France to another small town called Cambrai in the Northeast and um, lived in France for 17 years. And um, during this period, I, taught in various art schools. Um, these schools are basically universities. They're offering MA courses, uh, sort of BFA and MA courses in France. Art schools still remain independent and they haven't all moved into universities. And they are very different animals and they're very competitive and, um, and have really great facilities and offer amazing opportunities. This was my first exhibition project in France, which came through the art school that I was teaching in, um, the Ecole Supérieure d'Art in Valenciennes. And this was an exhibition called uh, Football and Immigration. And it was just prior to the World Cup, uh, the World Football Cup, which was hosted in South Africa that year. 
and um, no, sorry, the Rugby World Cup was hosted in South Africa. The Football World Cup, I think, was hosted in France that year. Well, I may be confusing things. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> the best there. But we held this amazing exhibition called Football and Immigration, worked with groups of refugee footballers, um, with NGOs. It wasn't a ceramics exhibition. It was a fine art exhibition in an amazing space called Cité, de Cité Nationale de l'Histoire des Migrations which was an institution set up to engage with the multiple histories of immigrants into France. Um, and, and it was a really beautiful exhibition, um, as I say, in a very challenging space. This is sort of some of the, the making of that show. Um, I continued working independently on my research in South African ceramics. And I was, uh, it sort of became an obsession I felt cut off from my homeland, cut off from a lot of things that were very important to me. I was very frustrated because um, both in Spain and in northern France, I, I felt that people didn't understand. Ceramics was viewed, yes, didn't understand my, my political interests in craft. Um, and there was it within Europe, there are such high hierarchies, such massive hierarchies. Um, anyway, so I continued researching independently for many years. And finally, in 2015, um, I published Scorched Earth uh, after many, many years of, of research. And, um, and it's the first comprehensive, I'll just read the little text. It's the first comprehensive history of fine art potteries in Southern Africa. So Southern Africa is South Africa, Lesotho, um, Botswana, uh, Namibia, and I think I touched on Mozambique, or I, may, you know, I mentioned Mozambique. And um, it was really encyclopedic in its, in its revisionist history of often overlooked sector in Southern Africa, and um, explores the work of 30 potteries that produced high quality ceramic wares over the last 100 years. The book promises to be the definitive history of Southern African ceramics, giving voice to many artists whose work is little known throughout the wider world. It contains 300 color photographs and archival images, 400 biographies and wide ranging history of the art, sorry, of this art form in Southern Africa. Um, yeah, so, so it was a massive undertaking and um, it's quite a, quite a massive book. This is it. It's, you know, it's like two, two and a half kilos. It's, it's, a, it's quite a serious tome. Um, it was published in an edition of 500 and it is no longer unfortunately available. Um, it has sold out internationally which is amazing because so many or so few books are, are published on the subject in the past. Um, those books have, have actually been pulped because they didn't sell. Um, what I think, what is the difference? I'm not sure. Um, the, the book looks like a coffee table book, but in fact, and it's very beautiful. I really wanted it to be extremely beautiful. And, and I'm just going to open it randomly. It's open. In fact, there's a Kalahari. There's lots of kind of really big, beautiful images. And um, here we go. Some sort of text. And it's, it's, it's beautifully laid out and looks like a, a fancy coffee table book. But when you actually start reading, it's very much a worker's history, and it's about writing the, the lives of black potters and artisans into the history of Southern African ceramics. When I did this work, I at one point I felt like an ambulance chaser. All the black artisans um, and artists I were interviewing were in their 50s and 60s mostly, and all of them were dying of industry-related illnesses, of silicosis, tuber tuberculosis, Etc. Um, I realized that the industry was literally created on the blood of black 
workers and and this in a time where most people knew about occupational health and security and you know it certainly should not have happened um, in the way it did and it, it was it was a real journey for me um, and so the book kind of has this I'm not sure if I should use the word perverse twist but it's it's an engaged twist and and is it sort of has this it has this barb in its tail and um, while it while it, while it looks uh, looks like a coffee table you know it's just these endless biographies of people who will only ever be written about in this book it's their first mention and probably the last mention with the exception of of a very few including perhaps Durant Sishlali and a few other African artists who um, who had practices in other media and were recognized um, as, as significant artists beyond ceramics. The next big adventure in my life um, was Taiwan. This photo was taken on a day when there was my, I experienced my first earthquake in Taiwan and it was really scary. Um, it, this is taken in Sanxia. Uh, what, what was really interesting about this project not only was did I experience this incredible sort of geographical or you know experience the earth tremble, my building tremble and see things fall. But but at the same time, Taiwan was going through what was known as the Sunflower Revolution and um, in the build up to the Taiwan Biennale, the legislature was occupied for nearly a full month in a peaceful demonstration by students um, who wanted more democracy and transparency in the relationship with China. And this was also at a period of elections where, which were called 12 and one elections where pretty much everybody but the president got reelected. So 12 different levels of voted authorities were replaced and the ruling KMT was basically kicked out of power in, in a very, very decisive um, political move away from the ruling party. Um, why, what does this, what influence does this have on a Biennale? Huge, because Biennales are big budget events and um, are spaces for political maneuvering by local politicians. And it was within this context that um, I very naively kind of ventured. So my first, this was my first really big international gig. I was super lucky to win this international curatorial competition. I worked really hard on my, my dossier and um, was extremely honored to, to be selected. Uh, um, the Biennale was probably the largest proper exhibition um, in real life exhibition that I've curated with 65 artists from about 35 countries. And um, I was involved for the design the installation, a cultural tour, a two day, conference with parallel demonstrations, a documentary film, a catalog, a 3D online experience, etc, etc. What was amazing about this Biennale and the, the context of it, which was far more than just cultural diplomacy, was um, the, the Taiwanese excitement around ceramics and new technologies and around ceramics and um, what I'd say, I, there were the, well, they were around ceramics full stop and around this Biennale, um, which attracted 660,000 visitors in a period from May to October 2014, um, which, you know, that's over 100,000 per month. You know, do the maths, it's nuts. You just don't want to actually visit those kind of exhibitions. Um, and uh, I realized very soon that, you know, I didn't want to be there. The exhibition opened and, and I know now with Biennales, as a curator, you just get out. It's it's horrible. You've had your moment with the works. You've enjoyed the space, but 
that it really becomes masses and masses of tourism, of tourists and locals jostling to see the work. I think the other thing that's really important for me about this Biennale was that it refined my thinking about diversity and um, I set very clear agenda for age, gender, geographical race and other diversity criteria, including GLBQT+. Um, and, and I implemented these. It was the first Biennale that had so many non-Western artists and it was it got a huge respect because I'd done all my homework and I spent so long making lists of artists who had been shown on all the biennales in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. And I just effectively eliminated all those artists and said, we're going to have a fresh crop. And I'm bringing in independents and emerging artists of all ages um, and and making something that's quite radical and edgy with new with with the new kids on the block or people who deserve recognition and deserve that platform. Uh, what was really great about Taiwan was that I got to um, do a a handbook and as, as well as a catalog. And the handbook was really fun. It's about the making of. So the artists presented the making of the the installations for the Biennale. This is um, just on the artist tour. Nearly all the participating 65 artists attended the conference. They all got funding and it came in. So it was a really joyful and joyous event. This is just a handful of the, the artists and VIPs. The, one of the, um, in fact, you'll notice on that image, there's Kakuli Velardi, one of the outcomes of that Biennale, and I'm sure Kakuri is not is well known to this audience, was well part of the Biennale. Kakuri Velardi installed work in the permanent collection, and that really ups, unsettled the permanent collection. Um, it highlighted the racism within the permanent collection, which depicted the indigenous Aboriginal people as extinct, whereas they're living people making work, ceramic works still. Um, they were presented as being fossilized and sedimentized and, and sort of in this, this cave with, with the sediment on the walls. It was really quite, it was very offensive. Um, so I wrote this essay called Plant Me Baby, Kokuri's Velardi and the Ceramics of Taiwan's First Nations, Virtual Ventriloquism as Articulated in the 2014 Ceramics Biennale, which really looked at how her installation integrated into the permanent collection and how that changed the permanent collection immediately afterwards. Um, the museum redesigned, redeveloped and rehung the permanent collection, including and especially the indigenous collection. And I think that's the power of art. It puts, puts its finger on very difficult questions. Um, my next stop um, was Jinzhou in central China and Henan province, where once again, I was very fortunate to win an international curatorial competition to curate the Taiwan, sorry, the, the first central China ceramics Biennale. As you can see from this image, is anything, well, this, this is on a good day. It's one of China's um, seven to 21 most polluted cities. And Catherine, who's on here, experienced that firsthand. It's, it's quite shocking. And um, the Biennale called Contract Earth really looked at um, one, our engagement with the planet, both um, on a literal level in terms of sort of the haptic and the malleable, and then on a more philosophical or environmental level, looking at our um, obligations to the Earth as custodians of this planet. So once again, um, another really big show with a monster budget and um, very challenging working in central China, very culturally challenging, professionally challenging, intellectually challenging. As a woman also, it was particularly difficult and um, I found it very misogynistic um, and I experienced a lot of racism towards artists of color, for example. Um, and and it, it, it was a very big challenge. And it wasn't even just 
around the racism. It was just um, within China, there's, there's the hierarchy and the hierarchy looks after the hierarchy and um, they don't, they didn't want any independent artists. Um, and I had to, and I didn't want women artists and I had to fight really hard to get women included. They, they kept throwing off artists from developing countries um, and coming up with strange excuses. They, yeah, it, it, it was it was it was really interesting experience and a great experience, um, but one where I really had to fight for fifty percent women, and I had to once again really instate quotas and fight for quotas of women, people of color, um, and and just really sort of push that diversity agenda really hard. Otherwise, it would have been all white. And yellow men, um, if if and, and they would have all been institutionalized. It would have all been academics and and people who were yeah you know known to the the milieu. Um, the spinal had three hundred fifty five thousand uh, visitors over the over a period from um, December to March. So once again. A, a little crazy um, and it had a, a big catalog um, and no it, it is what it is moving on at the same time and in parallel to the Chinese Biennale I was jumping backwards and forwards between China at a, a ridiculous rate actually and I and kind of developing a real guilt complex about my carbon footprint, making a, an, an exhibition about environment, but being in an airplane every six to eight weeks, doing these long haul flights to China because they, do, they didn't want to work unless I was there. Um, or the work didn't happen unless I was there. And, and it was a very strange relationship where I was, um, yeah, where, where I was expected to be in China um, all the time. So, I then moved on to Israel, Palestine, and did a project for the Benyamini Contemporary Ceramic Center in Tel Aviv. And um, that exhibition was called Post-Colonialism, and it really looked at settler occupation, one can't use the term colonialism in Israel. And um, once again, it was, well, it, 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 this exhibition perhaps more than any other really challenged me I suppose on an intellectual and an emotional level, um, I worked with ways to, to deal with breaking the silence and speaking out. And we had a Palestinian artist on board, only one, but that was still amazing because of the um, Pat B boycott. And um, it, it was a really brilliant experience. I, there were two films made, well, one, one film, so, but there's a seven-minute a seven-minute trailer and a 14-minute documentary. And I put the link for that in the chat. Please do watch that. Everybody who sees it says it's really amazing. And, and I think it is a very beautiful and touching film if you haven't already seen it. Um, there's an online catalog for this. In the process of working in Israel, um, there was a series of arson attacks and it felt like at one point, in fact, the day before, like it felt like the whole of Israel was burning. The fires got closer and closer to Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv was covered in smog and we were seriously questioning, you know, are we gonna, you know, sort of two o'clock that afternoon, we were questioning, are we gonna open this show at 5 p.m.? The fires were brought under control and, and it happened. Um, but you know, it was, it, it was also one of these kind of deeply, well, the whole project was very deeply disturbing, or really made me, made me reflect very deeply about what my values were and um, how I operated with, within the public space and what the boundaries between public and private were, specifically in respect to this film. I had this lovely filmmaker parachuted um, into the project and filming me 24 seven. 
And the further along I went in the project, the more sensitive I became to all the grief stories and trauma stories of the artists that I was just crying all the time and I couldn't stop it. I was just like, I'm one of these people you turn the tears on and I can't switch the tap off. And I was bawling all the time and, and aware that I was on camera and it was one of these terribly awkward, awkward, awful things and being extremely humiliated about crying on camera and knowing that this is going to go out to the world, that I'm falling apart. And at some point, Shlomit Bauman, the local curator, said to me, she said, oh, Wendy, you're not the curator, you are the curator. <laughs> and so I, I kind of, well, I just took it. And yes, I am. I became the curator. It's like I can just, you know, that deals with it. That deals with it. I'm the curator. And um, I own it. I totally own it that I that I'm the curator, and this term is something I associate with my practice and working in trauma environments and in conflict zones. Um, next step was um, I think yeah you know, I really I realized I needed to really digest what I'd learned from these projects and think through what I'd what I'd lived as a curator specifically around Israel and, and China and the challenges that these had posed to me as an intellectual and as a scholar. And so I did my PhD. Um, as I said, I'm a turbo nerd. I did it in one year. I mean, but I was so ready. I had everything lined up and I did like a PhD from A to Z and I had it submitted in a year. Um, and it was called Ubuntu Man Manifest decolonizing research and curatorial practices in ceramics. Um, and I realize we, we are going on for time, so I'm going to push on, but please feel free to ask me any questions um, if you're not sure, if you want any more information. So really, this looked at the philosophy of Ubuntu and, and how it could be used as a, a research, as a self-reflexive methodology for research and curatorial practices, um, and um, and I used that term curator, sorry, curator, and really fleshed it out um, as to to what that could be as a as a tool, as as a as a methodology, um, and as a concept for expanding the curatorial narrative. Um, my last project that I've done, curatorial project most recently was the Ceramics for Change virtual exhibition with Vipu, whose lovely brooch I'm wearing, Vipu Srivlasa from Taiwan, sorry, yeah, from Thailand, who lives in Australia, and Josh Collinson. Um, it was a really wonderful event, which included lots of grassroots artists as well as more established artists um, from across the globe and raised uh, almost 11,000 US dollars for different charities fighting Black Lives Matter. Most recently, I published an article on the um, early modern South African pioneer, Samuel Makunyani, who lived in the 40s and has kind of been written out of or was largely forgotten and a very important artist. Currently, I live in London in the UK. Um, and I live near Richmond Park, and it's the most amazing natural environment. It doesn't feel like I live in a big city, although I do. Um, Richmond Park, which is depicted on the right, is just on my doorstep. Uh, with the pandemic, I set up a coaching business, and I work with artists to help them advance their practices and move it to the next level. 2020 hit, um, and I'd already pivoted, and I kind of just been thinking about the environment and you know these were the this is how the new year started with a message saying climate change or the or, you know all the newspapers were saying climate change 2020 was the hottest year on record we know 2021's actually surpassed that quite extensively and so I set up an environmental management um, uh, not-for-profit called Clean Green Ceramics that certify ceramic artists, studios, uh, potteries and educational institutions for best practices in environmental management. So what does that look at? It looks at raw materials, atmosphere, energy. It looks at studio practices, shipping and transport. 
I'm currently working on a series on, on, on quite a few projects, research projects. These are my upcoming publications. I've got one on um, a um, woman called Klubo Kang, which looks at her pottery, which was completely written out of a historical narrative. Um, and that's going to be published in a monograph on craft and war by the University of Leuven in the Netherlands. No, sorry, in Belgium. Or was it? No, Netherlands. I can't, I'm oh, sorry, I can't remember. Um, uh, I've got a book that's waiting to be written on and, and that is in draft format I, and I need funding for, for a very substantial book on green and sustainable ceramics practices. And I also have two journal articles that are being published. One on research methodologies and one more specifically on cry rating, which comes out of my PhD and really looks at the need to revise curatorial programs in higher education to deal with the fact that curators are dealing with real people and not all. Well, obviously you left the message at the... Yeah. Sorry, somebody's... Did they um, give you any idea when she Yeah, went? so this is me once again. Um, if you want any information about any of my curatorial work, it's on the Wendy Gers, my coaching work, it's on ceramicscoach.com and my environmental consultancy on Clean Green Ceramics. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you, everybody, for, for you know, joining me on this whistle tour of my of the last 25 years of my life. Um, please keep up to date with my news on my Instagram, Wendy Goes. Thank you very much. Elaine, I can't hear you. That's because I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Wendy, would, would you stop your screen sharing now so we can open this up for questions? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Wow, what a career. I'm, I'm um, just mind boggled. But I'd like to open it up for questions from anyone here. We just have about 10 minutes left. So anyone have anything for Wendy? There's a message from Sam saying, thank you. I'm at the beginning of a practice-based PhD at University of Sunderland. So curious to hear um, your journey and wow, thanks Sam. And I must just like give a shout out to University of Sunderland. They were amazing. You know, they, if it, I can't think of any, I was so blown away by, by how efficient they were. And, you know, they just set up everything. I was a distance student. I had access to everything. I had all the training I needed. Within the first week, I was like, you know, I was, I was ready to go. And it was such a painless process. Um, it, was, it was brilliant. And the support I got was, was excellent. So um, really great. You know, I, I'm sure it'll be a great experience. Josephine, um, Elaine, maybe I'm going to hand you questions and you can, there's a lot coming in, so you can moderate. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. I, have, I only have Wendy, I'm, I only have uh, Joe Shays. How about curator? Great. And, and, and that's what, uh, you know, the word actually means. Curare means to care. So, yes, but traditionally the care is for artworks. It's not for people making the works. And curators specifically within, I would say, within the UK and more generally in the world, um, curators are working with people, with living artists, and, and art has become, how do I say it? There's a lot of a lot of the funding is attached to social development projects, and so curators are working with different audiences and in different ways from the classical curatorial training, which trains you to work in institutions. Um, and and you know what, what I felt was that what I really feel very strongly is that I've seen this transition personally, and that one needs to set in place a recognition um, of a very different skill set for curators um, than, than the sort of more traditional 
tra MA training that, that focuses on, so that trains one to think, but, but trains one in a very institutional way and doesn't deal with the, the sort of the curative or the criative um, elements. Wendy, there's a, uh, a question from Joe Loria. Can you approach the publisher of Scorched Earth to reprint the book? She looked it up and it's $1,000 on Amazon. Um, if they are unwilling, can you regain the rights and self-publish? Um, it's something I can, I can certainly look into. Um, yeah, yes, it is. As, as, as I mentioned earlier, South Africa is currently in a state of civil unrest and I don't think any businesses are going to be functioning for the next few weeks. Um, and yeah, I mean, even when I did this book in 2016, it was, it was a huge financial risk for the publishers. And I spent two years fundraising to mitigate the risk for the, the publishers. So I, I don't, I, you know, in all honesty, given the economic realities currently in South Africa, I don't see, see that as too viable an option. Um, Joe? Yeah, um, hi. I just unmuted myself. Hi, Wendy. Yes, well, hi. I was, I was going to say, since you have a, a really robust and operable uh, Facebook page, you, sh you could take pre-orders and then tell the publishers that you've already gotten, uh, you know, enough people to substantiate another printing of 2,000 copies and it, or just ask for the rights back after a certain amount of time. Um, you would be able to go to another publisher because it is the only book I think that has been done on South African ceramics. And, and if those of us who know very little about it want to learn about it, we have a f very few channels. Exactly. There, there are very few channels and, you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very sad that, that, that this knowledge is, is so restricted, you know, to, to 500, to, to 500 books that went very fast. Um, it, is, it is not the only book on Southern African, on ceramics. There have been books sort of every 20 years, there is a book published on the field. Um, it's probably one of the latest and certainly the most extensive on, on the subject. Um, the, Vilma Cruz did a, a very good book uh, about 25 years ago. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you, Joe, and I'll definitely approach the publishers. Thank you. Or, or use your ICA connections and um, have that community, um, you know, request request it so that the publisher knows that there's there's this demand. I know publishers are are now too, as well in in you know the financial throes of of how do you, you know, regain the um, their initial capital investment back, but I, I think they're also pretty savvy when it comes to a book uh, that they know they can sell. Yes. Um, Wendy, I wanted to mention too, I know that you're on the council of the IAC, but Anna has some links that she would like to post about the upcoming General Assembly in September. So she will put that those in the chat um, for anyone who's interested in that. And uh, Fiona says, a wonderful presentation, Wendy, just like to know how you feel about the current environment of online biennales and ceramic conferences. Like, like everybody, very frustrated. Um, it's so much better to experience art in, in real life. Um, although, you know, you know, and I sort of feel I'm repeating what everybody knows. The, the, the move online has created amazing communities and um, I'm really excited by, by so many of the online exchanges I have and meetings I have with people who I couldn't have, or wouldn't have met previously. Obviously, I hope that curating will change to, to being far more environmentally friendly um, in, you know, as I ex related my experience about China and, and my terrible guilt and having to travel all the time. And um, it, it didn't, it doesn't have to be like that. It, it isn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. In Israel, I went into Israel and Palestine 
two weeks before the exhibition and two or three weeks before the exhibition and work with the artists on the sort of the final push of their projects. Um, and I didn't, you know, I didn't, in fact, and I went straight from Israel to, to China, but for, for that opening, um, what do I think? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't wait to, to be post-pandemic and, and have real shows and, 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 and have those, those real experiences, which I think we're all really missing. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I mean, I think I, I've done online things and, and they're great, but it doesn't replace the real thing. And, and I think as materials orientated community in particular, um, it's very frustrating to, to have everything online. Um, and then I, I did say um, in the chat that if you are new and several of you have already posted your email addresses, but you're, if you're new and would like to be included in the email that goes out for each of these meetings, please put your email uh, contact information in the chat. And then one final question. Um, well, I didn't, I didn't ask you the one question I wanted to ask you, and that was, how can we encourage and uh, possibly mentor or but encourage more writing in ceramics and using and encouraging young and emerging writers? It's a really good question and, and, you, and, and one that I don't really have an answer for, but I do think creating um, grants and fellowships. And for me, what's really important in terms of growing writers is to grow global writers and writers from um, the non-Western world, because there are so few ceramic writers um, outside of outside of um, the United States and and Europe um, on the African continent. Like African-born, I'm aware of three significant writers. Um, Non-African-born, there's um, in writing about Africa, there's probably another three or four um, American and European writers writing about African ceramics. There's, there's probably a handful of seven, seven or eight scholars writing about African ceramics. And um, I, I kind of feel all the time I want to move on. But if I, if I don't stop writing about African ceramics, there's a huge hole and there's a vacuum and it's very difficult to I've personally mentored and mentored uh, a scholar, and it's been a wonderful journey. Um, but I've done that just because 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 I believe it's so important to have scholars in in our field, and there's such there's so much to research, and um, it's so important to have those those histories. Um, but yeah, so so you know, setting up spaces for the support of emerging voices and, and specifically global voices, I think is really important to broaden ceramics, um, the ceramic discourse. Okay, um, anyone else? Wendy put up her email address. If you have other questions for her, just feel question. free to, um, pardon? I've got a, a quick question and I raised my hand, but you didn't say it. So it's, it's, if, if there is a second, I would like to ask it. Okay, go ahead, Neely. Um, okay, Wendy, uh, thank you very much for your amazing uh, presentation. And I would like to ask you, being uh, from South Africa, but not living in the, in the country, would you say that it, this make your research about the culture in South Africa easier? I, I lived in South Africa for 30 years, so, so I think so, yes. And um, as a curator, I had a really great boss who, the first thing I did when I started was, she said, go for a month and visit every museum in the country with a ceramics collection. Um, because she knew I was interested, well, she was interested in ceramics, I, we, I was interested in ceramics, she said, and just you know, go and meet all the curators and meet everybody, and a lot of those curators some of them are there, some of them have changed, but 
but I had this phenomenal opportunity to to travel for a month and really spend time visiting collections in very intimate ways and getting a sense of the holdings of all the major and uh, national and provincial museums. Um, so yes, I think I've got a huge knowledge that that I didn't realize I had, um, but just just that opportunity opened up this this vast panorama of of our national heritage, and the curator of the Izika South African National Cultural History Museum, an amazing scholar and curator called Esther Esmoyle, has been in that post for the last twenty years, and it's is super knowledgeable and super enthusiastic. So any time I've got a query, I just write to Esther and write to colleagues, and they're all extremely generous. Um, so. I don't know if that answered your question, Lily. Yeah, <laughs> but yes, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Yes. I think, I think um, it does help to come from the country, but more specifically, to have had this opportunity to to visit these collections and have done research. When I also came in, got my first curatorial post, I did. I sort of did a survey of all the museums to try and understand what the holdings were and who was collecting what, and try and understand the hierarchies. I was actually more interested in the political hierarchies around craft commerce or artisanal and commercial pottery and sort of fine art pottery. I was interested in all those hierarchies and I did a bit of writing on that. But but that that set, formulating that question gave me such access into all these collections and 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 sort of you know I would see this artist like who's written about them? Oh somebody wrote about just like this racist ethnographer wrote about them in 1920 and it's like how how come this artist has never been seen or heard of again? This is really important stuff. So, you know, those kind of questions just happen naturally. And then the research follows in a very natural way. And I sort of, you know, I try to present my my, paper, my presentation today is, is that really, I think growing up in South Africa, yes, it has really framed the way I, I view life. From my very first exhibitions, everything had to be, about quotas and as a white curator, one can't, one had to, in a, in, a, in a city and in a population in a country where the population is 95% black, exhibitions have to represent communities and and one, one is, has to be extremely mindful in the way one curates um, diversity in, in, all its, in all its aspects. Um, so, that, that, that is probably something that that is, is, is a great privilege. I mean, it was a privilege that I had that opportunity from right from the outset. And those a lot of those questions have not been asked within more mainstream ceramic circles until very recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thank you, Wendy. You're welcome. Okay. Well, I appreciate everyone being here quite a few new ones and I hope we'll see you again if you've put your email in the chat. Um, but thanks so much for new people and regulars. I appreciate you being here. And uh, I, next month, Rob Barnard will talk about his new book and I'll send out information on that as it gets closer. So um, have a great day and great weekend. Thank you, Elaine, and thank you, everybody. It's lovely seeing so many familiar faces, and, and I look forward to continuing this conversation offline um, with, with many of you. There were, I see there's a few people that will reach out. Thank you very much, and Great. it's been a privilege. Thank you so much, Elaine, for your fabulous forum. This is a really wonderful, informative place for people who are first-timers. Please come back. Elaine has amazing guests. Great. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Great to see you, Fiona. <laughs> Everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>